Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. This is your girl, Yannick Taylor, a.k.a. Priestess, hostess of Conversations with the Priestess. Here's a preview of what you may hear on Conversations with the Priestess. We weren't meant for monogamy, let's be honest. Like, we have needs, let's be real. And communicating that, what you want, what you don't want, what sets up... Now, this drink is brown, because I learned something. Since I'm older, I can't do brown liquor anymore. Also, I noticed since I started on hormone replacement there at HRT in 2015, me and certain liquors don't match, don't match well. I don't know whether... And I recognize that a lot of men love to be dominated by women. And that's because men are seen as these leaders, as this big alpha male dominant thing, dominant being. And because they're put on this pedestal of being leaders, sometimes they want to be submissive. Back when I cosplayed a butch queen in South Carolina around 2011, I was on Craigslist. This is when Craigslist was bumping and before they had gotten rid of the personal section. I hope you enjoyed that preview. Join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. for Priestess After Dark. Full video versions of the podcast can be found on patreon.com forward slash CWT Priestess. And join me on Fridays at noon for our regular Friday post. Live, love, and be free. Smooches. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere you download and stream podcasts. Age of Radio. Welcome, everybody, to the Cray Twins series. I wanted to release a couple episodes before this, but, you know, I was sick for a little bit. I'm good to go now. It didn't happen, so I figured, fuck it, we're just going to jump right into the craze. But before we do, I have to give a huge shout out to a local musician out of Indiana whose music will be featured on part two, possibly part three, hopefully part three. Uh, I'd like to get a couple samples out to you guys. Uh, His name is Ace King. I love trying to help local musicians. He's a very, very talented rapper, and he's homegrown, man. He's out of Indiana, so of course I'm going to promote that. Gotta love it. Look for part two to feature some custom, some custom music, man. It's going to be totally different from what's usually on here, but it's going to be good nonetheless. So huge shout out to Ace King. You can find his music on YouTube pretty much anywhere. Um, Go check it out. Another huge thank you to a dude named Michael Wood. Uh, he provided the audio track for the intro for this. Um, he's from England and he did it perfectly. It's a great twins quote, hit it, nailed it. Perfect. And also happy belated birthday to his soon to be wife, Kirsty. She turned the dirty 30 not too long ago. And listen, man. All right, Michael, I know I thanked you about a hundred times. Well, maybe like two or three for the, for the audio recording that you did for me, but I don't invite myself to wedding receptions very often, but if I have an opportunity to take my white trash self over to England for a wedding reception, listen, man, you don't even have to send an invitation. Just message me, bro. We're we're friends on Facebook. But no, anyway, happy birthday to his missus, and thank you, Michael, so much for the audio clip. Other than that, we got Patreon subscribers, got quite a few of them, and everybody on Patreon has already heard this episode ad-free. I got a lot of good feedback from it, so I'm hoping you guys like it, too. Um, I got to thank Dustin Anderson, Jennifer Anderson, Lyndon from the podcast Murder at Bedtime with Lyndon. For those of you who want a new podcast, one of the most soothing English voices ever. And I'm actually going to have him on for an interview after I get done with this series because he, he remembers, you know, the Cray twins and the funerals and all that good stuff. So I actually get to talk to somebody who remembers a lot of that stuff. Got to thank Patricia Hill, Jess from Shoes, Booze, and Tattoos. Obviously, she's been on the podcast before uh, a couple times with my uh, Isabel Gowdy episode and Edgar Allan Poe episode. Thanks to her as well. We got John Howard, Joe G, Josh R, Donna Womble, Charlotte Van Houtvink. I hope I pronounced that right, Charlotte. If I didn't, I'm so sorry. 
and Jeff Mills. Thank you so much to all of you. And a lot of those new Patreon subscribers are in the $10 a month tier. Dude, get a hold of me, you guys. Let's get the Skype calls. You guys are entitled to that stuff. I mean, we can do it over Facebook. We can do it over Zoom. It doesn't matter. You guys are entitled to it. Hit me up, justin.mcpodcast at gmail.com. If anybody else would like to subscribe, you can go to patreon.com slash mysterious circumstances. We got a whole bunch of episodes there for you, and I release the bigger episodes ad-free before I release it on the regular feed. So also Venmo, one-time donations at MC Podcast. Without further ado... My name is Justin, this is Mysterious Circumstances, and you're listening to The Cray Twins, Part 1. Born in 1933 in the heart of the East End, Ronnie and his twin brother Reggie started out as boxers. They became the most feared of London's gang leaders. Known as The Firm, Ronnie and twin Reggie ruled London's East End in the early 60s, a reign that somehow horrified and fascinated the British public. They were good guys, they were good gangsters, if you want to use such a word. They wouldn't harm women or children, they were untouchable. They would resort to violence at the slightest provocation to establish a reputation, and this they did very, very successfully. Reggie was very calm, he'd done things very coldly, you know. If he was going to stab you, he'd just stab you. I think where Ronnie would have killed in anger, Reggie would have killed in hate. I can remember someone coming into the, the club and uh, Reggie Christ shoving a comb through their cheeks. Reggie had a long-tailed aluminium-type comb, steel comb, which he shoved through the man's cheeks, both cheeks, tied in a knot. They rolled him up in a carpet and took him out. Ronnie and Reggie Cray, the twins who became the undisputed bosses of East End gangland. Were they born villains, or did fate shape them for the role? Reggie went in to this uh, mental hospital. I thought Reggie came out and we drove off in a bit of a hurry. I must say, I mean, I was being driven. I wasn't, I was in their car. So I turned round to Reggie like an idiot and said, uh, how was Ronnie? He said, well, I'm bloody Ronnie. He said, Reggie's in there now. And I thought, Jesus, what have I got myself into? And he said, yeah, they shouldn't have put me in there in the first place. I'm perfectly sane. Why should they do that? They would hear of the misdeeds of other young criminals in the East End, and they would want their pickings. They were known in the East End as thieves' ponces. That means that they steal off the thieves or take proceeds of their crime. The Cray twins were far too violent, far more violent than was necessary, and they were clearly getting off on the violent. They weren't really rough people. They were quite gentlemen, you know? It was only if you crossed their path the wrong way that you suffered. They were very, very good at their job. If they hadn't started killing people, they probably would have been in the House of Lords by now. They commanded a hell of a lot of respect. The name was very, very well known and very, very feared. I can assure you of that. They were the best years of our lives. They called them the swinging 60s. The Beatles and the Rolling Stones were rulers of pop music. Carnaby Street ruled the fashion world. And me and my brother ruled London. We were fucking untouchable. So to put a little context into the Cray Twins, we're not going to add too much context because the Cray Twins is enough information that somebody could honestly create a podcast just on the Cray Twins. So before the Crays, the docks of East London, there was lots of money to be made there. It was good for gangsters. It was controlled by gangsters. And the East End was controlled by two guys named Billy Hill and Jack Spot. There was lots of violence, all right? East End was lower middle class. Uh, a lot of people found boxing to be one of the few ways to actually get out of the East End, you know, if they didn't get into criminal activities and shit like that. So that explains a lot of the the whole Cray family, not even just the twins, but the family in general, were some fighters, all right? Trust me, man, this episode, this shit, and just keep in mind, this is just part one, all right? There is 
all kinds of crazy shit with these two dudes, even after they go to prison. Like, they both did, like, 30 years in prison. I mean, that's where they both died there. Still controlled shit. So, one thing you gotta know about the East End is that nobody trusted cops. Nobody talked to them. Even though there was a high crime rate, that was, like, the law in the East End. So, Ronald and Reginald Cray, both known as Ronnie and Reggie, were born on October 24th, 1933 in Hagerston, East London. They were twin brothers, all right? Reggie was born about 45 minutes before Ronnie. Uh, their parents already had a six-year-old son named Charles. Uh, he was born in 1927, died in 2000. He is a part of the firm, which was their gang name, so he does get brought up quite a bit. They also had a sister, uh, Violet, who died when she was an infant. Now, when the twins were three years old, they did contract uh, diphtheria, uh, not, you know, it's a pretty big deal, but not a huge deal. They're, they're fine, you know. Uh, their parents were Charles David Cray, who died in 1983. He was a wardrobe dealer, and he basically traveled around, and he would go and buy things from estates for cheap, and then he would turn around and go to another section of London and sell it. So he was not at home very often. He was always on the road traveling, um, their mother, Violet, uh, her maiden name was Lee. She passed away in 1982 and she was, um, she, from every account that I have heard from people who knew the Cray twins, who knew Violet said that their mother was just like the, an amazing, just average woman, the nicest, you know, you'd go to their house, she'd serve you tea and whatever else and just just a very, very nice woman. Now, she might have taken it easy on the craze when they were younger, um, and their father wasn't around to really discipline them too much, but at the same time, they respected their mother quite a bit. I mean, respected her, so that should be known. Now, the twins first attended Wood Close School in Brick Lane, uh, and then they went to the Daniel Street School. In 1938, the Cray family moved from Steen Street in Hagerston to 178 Valance Road in Bethnal Green, and that would become their headquarters in the future, would literally be their mother's house. Now, during the Second World War, the twins were evacuated to East House in Hadley, Suffolk. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, that was with their mother, Violet, and their older brother, Charles. They stayed at East End with the owner's doctor and Mrs. Style for about one year before moving back to London uh, because Violet, their mother, had missed her friends and other family. Now, while they were in Hadley, the twins attended Bridge Street Boys School. And when the twins were interviewed in 1989 while at, while at Broadmoor Hospital, Ronnie described Hadley as their first time pretty much being in the countryside. What appealed to both of them was just how quiet, how peaceful it was. They had fresh air, scenery. It was way different than East East End London. They had a lot of fond memories of that area. Now, both of them started distrusting police at a very, very young age, all right? And before I start getting into some more of these details, uh, I do have to state some sources here, okay? First, there's like a hundred documentaries on YouTube. Most of them are really good because you have associates, family members of the craze who gave interviews, you know, anywhere from the 1970s up until, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Now, the twins did write books themselves. It's hard to take somebody who writes their own story. Sometimes you got to take a lot of those facts with a grain of salt. You know, because they're going to exaggerate, they're going to paint themselves in a better picture for the most part. Sometimes people are honest, but that should be known. Now, the books I am referring to and used for sources are one of them was called Our Story, and it was written by Ronnie and Reggie Cray. Another one called My Story, which was written by Ronnie Cray. Born Fighter, which was written by Reggie Cray. Charlie Cray wrote a book called Me and My Brothers. And then John Pearson wrote a book called The Profession of Violence, The Rise and Fall of the Cray Twins. And then there's a lot of like Vice articles, CNN articles, it's stuff like that, various articles that I get this information from. 
Now, like I said, all of the brothers, and especially the twins, nobody trusted the police in the East End, really, especially the Cray family. One of the stories from Reggie's childhood that probably spawned of a lot of his distrust was he was on a train with his family coming back from a, from a picnic, and Reggie had an air pistol with him, and he fired it out the window while the train was moving, and a guard saw him do it and took him and locked him in the cabin on the train, and when he got out, Reggie told his mother that they went overboard while he was in there, and his mom was super protective, so that shit did not fly, and kind of instilled, you know, from an early age, a fuck you kind of attitude towards law enforcement or authority figures in general, as you're going to come to find out. So around 1939, 1940, this is another Reggie Cray story, okay? Reggie was around eight years old, and Reggie was playing with a friend of his. Now his friend was hired by a truck driver to start his work truck and help him load the truck and you know little kids would often do this it was a way for him to make a couple bucks or a couple pounds i should say whatever the case was and you know the truck driver he's like eh, fucking kids you know just give them a couple bucks they'll load up the truck so one day his friend gets in the truck and he asked reggie if he wanted to take a ride with him now mind you these kids are only like eight years old and Reggie's buddy started the engine and accidentally put the truck in gear. And the truck jumped backwards and hit a concrete barrier. And as soon as it hit the concrete barrier, the two boys heard a scream from behind the truck. And both went back there. And they found out that a six-year-old boy had been crushed between the truck and the barrier. And Reggie knew that this kid was dead because his head was just crushed and to make matters worse reggie later found out that this kid was a twin so that kind of you know that fucked him up a little bit he's like oh shit now after it happened the truck driver told the boys to lie for him you know or he would lose his pension and he didn't want anyone to know he had hired the one kid to start the truck for him because that would have fucked him out of his pension so the boys admitted to the cops they put it in gear but didn't start the truck. And uh, Reggie later said that he hated that man for putting his pension above that child's life. That kind of instilled like a little bit more of a distrust in, you know, authority figures in general or adults even for that matter. So, I mean, you know, I'm not playing devil's advocate because you're going to find out, man, twins did a lot of bad shit. They, they totally did. But from every account that I've read, they were pretty fair. You know, they never harmed women or children, and the only people they went after or did anything to were other criminals. So, I mean, that's kind of why they're still legendary, all right? So, in 1943, at the age of 10, the boys were getting into a lot of trouble at school. Um, I mean, in their early, early teens, around, the, you know, like 10 to 13, 14, 15 years old, the boys are scrappers, all right? All they knew was fighting because their maternal grandfather on their mother's side was a dude named Jimmy Cannonball Lee. He was known as the Southpaw Cannonball. For those of you who are not familiar with boxing, a Southpaw is a left-handed fighter. Jimmy Lee, he was the one who kind of saw the boys, you know, getting into a lot of fights and kind of steered them towards boxing, you know, as a way to kind of channel that anger and some of that violence, which, you know, I might be a little bit biased because I was a boxer when I was a teenager. When I was in high school, I got picked on a lot. Um, then I started getting into a little bit of trouble. My mom didn't want me to get into any more trouble wrong with the, run with the wrong people. So, you know, she's like, here, go learn how to box motherfuckers, you know, so... It is a great way to get a lot of that teenage aggression out. Some people stick with it. Some people don't, right? So the boxing, though, at the East End, like I said, for a lot of working class, younger boys and stuff like that in the East End, it was a way to get out, basically. Um, but Jimmy Lee, he was a straight badass this dude was an amazing athlete. He's a bare knuckle boxer, like all kinds of shit. Even the Cray twins' aunt, their mom's sister, whose name was Rose, 
she was actually known as one of the East End's biggest female fighters of the day, too. And she used to claim that she was equal to any man or two women who were brave enough to face her in the ring. <laughs> All right, so... This is the family that these dudes come from, and not to mention their older brother, Charlie, was a very accomplished boxer as well in the Navy, and we'll get to that here in a second, but one story about their grandfather. This is this is a pretty badass story. Their uncle had driven 42 miles outside of London for like a little vacation getaway or whatever. Now, when they arrived in their vehicle... Their grandfather also arrived at about the same time on a bicycle, all right? This dude rode a bicycle 42 miles when he was 75 years old. And then their uncle was like, listen, man, we're going to, uh, you know, take you in the car when we go to leave. You're not going to ride your bike back. And their grandpa was like, nah, or fuck you, man. Like, I can ride the bike back. I rode it here. I can ride it back just fine. That's the kind of <laughs> inspirations that, that these dudes grew up with. And so, like I had mentioned, you know, boxing was a huge on the East End. You know, it, they were influenced by their aunt, their grandpa, and their older brother, Charlie, who was a champion in the 40s. So, Charlie gets out of the Navy, and he starts teaching the boys how to box, like at home. He gets them a punching bag, and he trains them for one year. And then he took them to the boxing club and the boys started boxing for school and, uh, you know, some other independent entities and shit like that. A few different times, they actually had to fight each other. Now, the boys were great boxers, okay? They just kept winning. They could have gone really far with it. Ronnie, his heart really wasn't in it. He was more of a street fighter. He was known as uh, pretty uncontrollable and like an animal in the ring. Reggie could have really gone places, and he was very disciplined. He was very cold and calculated fighter. You know, he would think shit out. And Reggie says in his book that he was good enough because he could hit hard with both hands and that in his life fighting, he broke 11 jaws that he knew of. That's just what he knew of. You got to hit a hard to break somebody's jaw. I mean, if you hit him in the right place, you're going to knock him out. That's why you see fighters always going for the jaw and the uppercuts, the easiest knockout. Um, breaking a jaw on the other hand, depending on the person's bone structure, sometimes they got weak jaws, most of the time they got strong jaws, especially if you're in fighting for a long time, you start getting that uh, that strength. Now, this story right here that I'm going to tell you is... It's it's a little messed up. Some of you animal and horse lovers are not going to fucking like this. But to practice knocking people out, uh, while they were on vacation one day at uh, Caravan Park in uh, All Hallows, Kent, the twins practiced knocking people out by taking turns trying to knock out a tethered horse. All right, a tethered horse is one that is, uh, you know, tied up, and basically the boys were taking turns seeing which one could knock the horse out by punching it in the fucking face as hard as they could. Sorry, animal lovers. I, I hate telling that story because I'm a horse lover. I grew up with horses, but we got to stick with historical accuracy here. So in 1945, the twins were developing, and they were coming in to be, like, very, very good and capable fighters. Now, years later, Reggie would recall that their first mention of prank came at the age of 12, after he and Ronnie fought each other and earned a write-up in the Hackney Gazette. A lot of contemporary accounts uh, dismissed that the twins weren't that good at fighting, that their promoters would or their trainers would put them in the ring with bums to make them seem better than what they actually were. A lot of that narrative comes from people in later years who didn't like the twins. So take that with a grain of salt. In 1948... Reggie was the schoolboy champion of Hackney. He won the London Schoolboy Boxing Championships and was a finalist at the Great Britain Schoolboys Championship. So that's that's why I'm calling bullshit on the accounts that they just fought bums. Because we're about to go through some shit right here. The next year, 1949, 
He added the Southeastern Divisional Youth Club title and was London ATC champion. And remember, this is all Reggie at this time. Now, Ronnie was also picking up awards when he was at this age, too. He was a he was also a schoolboy champion of Hackney. He was a winner at the London Junior and London ATC events. A guy named John Pearson, who wrote the uh, previously mentioned book that I used as a source, he was a biographer for the Twins, he quotes one veteran trainer as saying, quote, Ronnie was a fighter, the hardest, toughest boy I'd ever seen. To stop Ron, you'd have had to kill him. Reggie was different. Before he even started, it was as if he had all the experience of an old boxer in his fists. Once in a lifetime, you find a boy with everything it takes to be a champion. Young Reggie was one of them. End quote. Now, as good at boxing as these two were, the fact that they were identical twins also gained them a shitload of notoriety in the, in the East End. Not only that, but they also start getting into a little bit of trouble. They start gaining a reputation. You know, they I've seen them referred to as the terrible twins before when they were younger. Um, now in that, uh, going back to 1948, this is when they were about 15 years old in 1948. They decided to leave school, all right? They worked in the uh, Billingsgate Fish Market, which was the biggest in Europe, and they worked there for six months. This was to be the longest legitimate employment they ever had in their lives. Reggie trained as a salesman, and Ronnie worked as an uh, empty boy, and basically he would go look around the market each day and he would collect empty fish boxes for for his boss and they also worked on the weekends and uh they would help out their their grandpa cray on his stall in uh, petticoat lane 1949 the boys are about 16 years old and the boys get into a fight with another group of kids outside a dance hall in hackney now after the fight one of the other boys went and reported it to the cops and he ratted on the craze, and this was a fucking unforgivable rule that you did not break. You did not talk to the cops in the East End. So the boys ended up being charged with grievous bodily harm, and they were acquitted due to lack of evidence. And, uh, you know, the local vicar gave them a little speech about being young boys and staying out of trouble and all that shit. So in 1950, there's another time, according to Ronnie... They were hanging around outside a cafe, and he was violently shoved from behind. Now, he turns around and looks, and he sees that it was a cop. And the cop was telling Ronnie and Reggie and their little buddies to basically get the hell out of there because they were loitering around. Now, Ronnie did not like getting touched or pushed around for that matter, so he knocked the cop out with one punch to the jaw and then the boys took off running. Shortly after that, a couple more cops found them and took Ronnie. All right, and they basically arrested him. Now, Reggie didn't like that. Hey, nobody fucking takes my brother anywhere. So he went back to the store that they were loitering at before, where Ronnie hit the cop, and he found the cop that his brother had knocked out, and then Reggie knocked him out too. So he was arrested and put in the same cell as his brother. <laughs> and uh, for for this, they both ended up receiving probation. Now, keep in mind, they were still able to continue boxing. All right. Even after getting into a little bit of trouble, they were still doing very well in boxing. Now, on July 31st, 1951, both twins fought at the arena in Mile End, and this was still right before they turned 18. They were still 17 years old at this time. And Reggie Cray outpointed a guy named Bobby Manito. And Ronnie scored a TKO win over a guy named Bernie Long. The next month in August, Reggie fought at the same venue, this time without Ronnie. And he won by TKO against a guy named Johnny Starr. The next month, 1951 still, both brothers were on the card at Wembley Town Hall, and once more they walked away. Both of them were winners. Uh, Reggie beat a guy named George Goodsall by TKO, and Ronnie repeated his result from Myland and beat Bernie Long again. 
Then the next month, in October, Reggie fought alone. This time, he won by points, and he beat a guy named Bill Sliney at the National Sporting Club in Piccadilly. A week later, he fought Sliney again and took the bout on points, this time in Shepherd's Bush, while Ronnie beat Goodsall by a knockout at the same venue. Reggie won again on November 19th, beating a guy named Bobby Woods at the National Sporting Club, uh, which was in Mayfair. Ronnie, his streak was over. He ended up losing by disqualification to a guy named Doug Sherlock. Then, the next month in December, like, these dudes are literally fucking fighting every single month. Competition events, that's, I mean, back in the day, that's probably how they did it, man, but that's fucking wild. Alright, so, in December of 51, the twins were selected to fight at Albert Hall, and they actually had their brother Charlie on the bill, too, so it was all three Cray brothers on the same bill. Reggie won decisively on points. Ronnie ended up being disqualified for unsportsmanlike behavior. At this point, Reggie is invited to turn pro, and Ronnie was not because, like I said, he was he was an amazing fighter, but he was very undisciplined. Man, the guy was like a fucking animal in the ring. So R Reggie was invited to turn pro. Ronnie was not. But Reggie's chances of going pro get a little bit of a setback because they have another brush with the law. In early 1952, a few weeks after the Albert Hall fight, the boys were involved in a huge brawl outside a nightclub. And the thing is, is that professional boxers were prohibited from fighting outside the ring. Like, you could not get in street fights, otherwise you'd lose your professional title you'd get your card pulled so and that's what happened with reggie his license was withdrawn and basically his professional boxing career was over right there and to make their story even more interesting right about this time the cray twins get drafted into the military service this is some entertaining shit right here okay so march 1952 the crays get called up to do their service in the british army and they had two choices. They could either go on the run and avoid their military service like their dad did. All right, their dad actually did this. He pretty much, he didn't really go on the run, but he just wasn't home to receive the calls. And every time the military showed up to basically say, hey, man, you know, it's time to go to the fucking army. Uh, he was not home. His dad was, their dad was always gone. So... The Krays had a decision. They were like, we can either go on the run, which they didn't want to do, or we can join. So they agreed to join if they could be physical fitness instructors. And they agreed amongst themselves. They're like, we can stay in shape. We can keep boxing. And they figured it would be beneficial for them and the military because they could train other boxers, which it, it does make sense. It's, it makes a lot of sense. But that's not how it works. So the twins reported to the Tower of London, and there was a corporal in charge there, and they walked in and they're like, okay, corporal, here's our deal. We want to be fitness instructors. If not, we're not going to uh, be here. <laughs> and so the corporal is like, not how it works, dudes. You're going to do whatever the fuck you're told. So the twins really didn't say anything, and they just turned around and they went to leave. And the corporal asked where they were going, and the twins didn't say shit. They just kept walking. So, And the corporal in charge goes and tries to stop them, and he grabs Ronnie's arm. You don't touch Ronnie fucking Cray, and you're going to learn that, all right? You don't fucking touch Ronnie Cray. Needless to say, this corporal was very seriously injured by Ronnie Cray, who punched him in the jaw one time, knocked him out cold, fucked him up. So... The Crays are like, well, let's go back. So they just walk back to the East End. You know, they just walk back home that night, and they decided to uh, go to one of the local dances. You know, no big deal. So the next morning, they were arrested by the police and turned over to the army, and they didn't even resist. They were like, all right, you know, we fucking did it. So they go back to the Tower of London, and they're charged with being AWOL and striking an officer. But the funny part is, because they were identical twins, 
They both pretended that neither of them actually hit the officer, and the officer couldn't prove which one it was, so they both got thrown into like a what they called the guard room. So they just decided to escape. They're like, well, you know, fuck this place. So they go AWOL again, okay? And they spend eight months on the run from the army. And this whole eight months, they're doing a lot of shady shit on the East End, okay? So in September of 1952, while they were AWOL again, they assaulted a police constable who tried to arrest them. They ended up uh, beating the shit out of this dude. And believe it or not, the Cray twins, because of that, became a few of the last prisoners to be held at the Tower of London before being transferred to Shepton Mallet Military Prison in Somerset for a month to await their court-martial. And when they were there, there was a guy in there who started talking to him about protection rackets. They're like, man, you guys are fucking fighters, dude. You're established. You have a reputation. People know your fucking names. And they're still young at this point in time. So they start. he starts talking to him about what protection rackets are. So they ended up getting convicted, all right? And both were sent to uh, Buffs Home County's Brigade Depot Jail in Canterbury, Kent. When it became clear that both of them were going to be dishonorably discharged from the Army, the Cray, the Cray Twins just got that much fucking worse, okay? They would go to the exercise areas. They would fucking dominate. They would basically control that shit. They would throw tantrums. They emptied a spit bucket over a sergeant. They dumped a canteen full of hot tea on another guard. They handcuffed a guard to their prison bars with a pair of stolen cuffs. And then they set their fucking bedding on fire. (laughs) They were just like, fuck it, whatever. You know, eventually they were moved to a communal cell where they um, assaulted their guard with a vase and escaped from there. So after being... Cat recaptured, which was very quickly. They spent their last night in military custody in Canterbury, and they were drinking cider, eating crisps, and smoking cigarillos. The serviceman who was in charge of them basically was like, here, man, you know, you guys are fucking out of here anyway. Might as well enjoy yourselves. So in 1953, they get dishonorable discharge from the army. And this is around the time Ronnie says that he really started to lose his fucking mind. And you're gonna come to find that Ronnie Cray was not mentally stable by any fucking stretch of the imagination. So that very next day, the Crays were transferred to a civilian prison to serve sentences for crimes they committed while they were absent without leave which is what AWOL is. I didn't explain that earlier. So then, after that, they ended up getting out of jail. So in 1954, at the age of 21, they had criminal records, dishonorable discharges from uh, the British Army. Uh, th- their boxing careers were done, all right? So they're like, well, what the fuck can we do? So they decide to turn to crime full-time. So at this point in time in London, the economy is picking up, it's booming, it's after World War II, and the Cray Twins take over a place called the Regal, and it's a rundown uh, billiard hall, it's a snooker club actually, in a Mile End, and this is right by their home. There were some guys going in and shaking the place down and causing problems, and there weren't very many regular customers because of this. So the Cray Twins approached the owner, and they were like, hey... We'll take care of any problems that you have if we get can get a lease on the business. So the owner gave them a month to see if any of the problems would stop. And the problems stopped immediately. And Ronnie said in his book, if someone in there was acting up or if they broke something, we'd break their fucking bones. I mean, as plain and simple as that. And the owner ended up giving them a three-year lease after that one month was up. So the Cray Twins, they started adapting to this style of business because they were good at it. And there's a here's a story. Five Maltese guys showed up demanding protection money one day. Reggie pulled out a knife. Ronnie pulled out a fucking sword. All right, so they chased them dudes away. They never came back. This was huge news in the East End. It made the papers, but the Cray Twins never got arrested. But 
the place never had any more problems after that, right? So they start getting this reputation for violence. And they started getting new friends that wanted to hang out with him. And they start going into bars and messing with people. And uh, certain little groups of their friends would hang out on certain streets. And the thing about it was, is all of them could fight and all of them were capably violent. One of the big things about the protection rackets was gambling was, I don't think it was illegal, it was kind of frowned upon, and um, the East End was filled with one-room clubs, alright, there's a name for them, I can't remember the name, but basically the cops would go in, shake these places down, and they would arrest these people, and they would just fine them, alright, so... Like, the cops really didn't fucking care what they were doing, but they were just rearresting him and, and let him out the next day and just fining him and making all this fucking money, right? And then there was also other smaller gangs or other, like, thugs going in there and fucking shaking these places down. So the craze are like, fuck it, man, we're good at this. We got a reputation. This is our neighborhood, okay? And they were locals. So they started offering protection services for those places. All right, and before we get further into more crazy stuff, let's go ahead and take a break. I'll meet you guys back here in a couple minutes. Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. The great visionary leader of India, Mahatma Gandhi said, it is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Listen to the Healthy Grocer radio show on your favorite podcast platform. We know that health is our greatest wealth and we will be discussing all aspects of natural healing. Explore everything from supplements, superfoods, and healthy lifestyle choices to help conquer stress and boost productivity. Top industry experts and natural health professionals join us for a deep dive into our healing journey. You can find the Healthy Grocer Radio Show on demand every day wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember, health is your greatest wealth. So this is where they started getting all those, like, protection rackets. And like I said, nobody trusted or talked to the cops in the East End. And the police really didn't do shit there. So the law basically was the Cray twins to a certain extent. But because the cops really didn't do anything in the East End, this made the gangs more prevalent. So some businesses were paying multiple gangs a week for protection. They would pay this gang to protect from this gang and then that gang to protect from this other gang. Well, the craze came in and they started policing all this shit themselves because, like I said, they were locals. This was their neighborhood. Everybody knew them. And businesses were happy to pay the craze because they were saving money and the craze were getting shit done. All right. They were known. I will say, like, the Cray Twins, their gang started getting known as, uh, you know, the firm. They were fucking feared, all right? People knew not to fuck with the Crays. They would beat people, just beat the shit out of them within an inch of their lives if they had to. And the kicker is businesses would actually seek them out to help protect their businesses. Some places would legitimately... Pay the Cray Twins to come sit down and have one drink in their fucking bar. And if people saw that the Cray Twins were in that bar having a drink, there was no more trouble in that place. That was the end of it. These dudes had a reputation from a very early age. Now, if a business had a problem, they would just send for the Crays, or some of their guys would show up and take care of the problem immediately and like i said businesses were happy to pay the cray twins and they were treated good you know they would come walk around the place have a beer had no problems and if they were seen in that establishment that establishment did not have any more problems because they were like we know if we go into this place and start shit 
we're going to have to fucking deal with the Cray Twins and their fucking gang. So through the 1950s, the Crays started getting into fraud, extortion, and like I said, this is where their gang starts getting known as the Firm. Now the Firm had certain rules, one of which was never hurt anyone who can't defend themselves. Never rat on anyone or anything, period. And never go on organized robberies. The firm had a reputation to keep up. All right. Now, if somebody was involved in a robbery and they found out who it was, they would have to pay dues to the craze. But the craze themselves would not go on these organized robberies. And around this time as well, you know, towards the mid late 50s, Ronnie starts becoming a lot more aggressive, even with members of the firm. Now, here's here's one story I, I heard this dude tell in a documentary because he was fucking there. And they were describing what it was like to deal with Ronnie Cray on a daily basis. One day, Ronnie Cray walks into the club, and he walks up, and he sees a few guys from the firm. And he walks up to a guy named George Dixon. He pulls out a Beretta pistol, and he puts it to his head, and he pulls the trigger twice, and nothing happens. It goes click, click. Then Ronnie pulls out two bullets, sets them down, and says, Here's your birthday present, George. And then just walked the fuck out of the place. That's crazy shit, okay? So, this is when everybody starts realizing that Ronnie is becoming way fucking unstable. And his use of violence is becoming very, very irrational. Now, by the end of the 1950s, the Crays are working for a guy named Jay Murray from Liverpool. And they were all involved in, like, hijacking, armed robberies, arson. They started acquiring other clubs and properties through this time, too. Now, in 1956, they get into a fight with a rival gang. And Ronnie attacks one of these dudes with a bayonet, right? And he ends up getting convicted of grievous bodily harm. And he gets three years in prison. So on May 6, 1957, while Ronnie is gone, Reggie and his older brother Charlie open up the Double R Club. And this was a legitimate club, all right? And the club scene was very profitable in this time in London. And it was a place for East End people, and they could go in pretty much like the West End of London, where it was upscale, there was more celebrity status, nicer high-end places. Well, they were trying to make the East End of London that same way. So there was live music, there was a jukebox, car park, there's a gymnasium, there was a boxing ring upstairs. Now, there were a shitload of celebrities who actually visited this place. So, I mean, it was it was good. This is a, a story that was recalled by a guy who still to this day wants to remain anonymous. He basically told a story of how the Cray twins dealt with shit, all right? He says, We were all at the bar enjoying a drink when a young bloke came in. He was about 19 years old. He was obviously well drunk. He started mouthing off, shouting abuse, and refused to quiet down. Suddenly, we were surrounded by the Cray henchmen. Reggie was there too. We were politely shown to an upstairs room where we could carry on drinking. But as I went up the staircase, I looked back, and one of the guys was slashing the youngster across the thighs with a fucking sword. You know what I'm saying? They did not fuck around, alright? Now, towards the end of Ronnie Cray's three-year sentence he got moved to Camp Hill prison and this was further away from his family further away from his friends and he starts getting depressed and then his aunt Rose dies of cancer and this was the twins favorite aunt they were very very close and very fond of her and his mental state just goes out the window he has a complete fucking breakdown and he starts thinking that everybody in the prison is trying to kill him So Ronnie ends up getting certified insane. He gets diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, and he was transferred to Long Grove Mental Hospital. While he was there, he still gets worse. He didn't even recognize people that would come to visit him. 
So he ends up getting put on these strong meds, and um, he started to feel normal again from what he said, and he stated in his book, you know, he was still struggling really, really hard, but he was starting to feel a little bit normal. Now, Reggie is on the outside looking in and seeing what this is, like, doing to him, like the death of their favorite aunt and the fact he's so far away from family and friends, and he's already very fragile mentally. So... The Krays come up with a plan. So Reggie and Charlie go to visit Ronnie one day. And when Charlie and Reggie go to leave, it wasn't Reggie who was leaving, it was actually Ronnie. The twins had switched clothes while Reggie was there. And after Ronnie and Charlie leave, Reggie walks up to the guard. You know, even though they had switched clothes, he had kept his ID on him. And he shows the guard his ID and says he's going home. And technically, since he wasn't a patient there, they had to let him leave. Let's listen to what Reggie had to say about this whole breaking out of the mental hospital. What decided me to to, to, to get Ron away from Long Road, not to and Epson, was some of the stories he told me about the place. One day, he was sitting there eating an apple. And this nut had come along and smacked him in the eye. Because he could tell you, just because he was eating an apple. He says, look, the place was full of nutters. So they end up calling, like, later that night with a deal. And the government says if Ronnie does well outside the mental hospital, they would review his condition. And if he did okay outside, they would release him permanently. So after a few months of being there, Ronnie returned to the hospital voluntarily. He was taken in and reviewed and then released a few months later, but his mental health was still really, really bad, and it was more than likely that he paid off the doctor, the craze paid off the doctor to say that he was way better, and all that shit. So, Ronnie gets out, and they start doing, you know, the club thing again. And here, here's a story about the club and Ronnie Cray, and this is according to Reggie. When he was released from prison, Ronnie Cray brought a donkey and dwarves into the club. Okay, shit you not. Donkey and dwarves. And this is from the book Our Story. And he says, one of the stage acts we had was Tex the Dwarf. He was a midget who wore an enormous Texan hat. He would climb on the back of a donkey, play a guitar, and sing cowboy songs. At the end of the act, Ronnie would walk over to the donkey, grab it by the reins, and lead it over to the bar. And he says, One night, Ron led the donkey over to the corner of the bar. He's got the donkey's reins in his left hand and a gin and tonic in his right hand. At that moment, a bookkeeper who owed Ron money walks into the bar. Ron saw the bookmaker and went fucking crazy, and he was telling him he better pay up or else. And Reggie says, I stood there watching because it was hilarious. There was Ron, sticulating and just laying down the law in general, with a donkey in one hand and a gin and tonic in the other. (laughs) And, uh, needless to say, the bookie didn't think it was that funny, ended up leaving the bar as soon as he fucking could, man, because it's Ronnie Cray, you know what I mean, so... (laughs) So, um, in 1960, the twins become shareholders in Esmeralda's Barn, and this is a good club in London's West End, and they started acquiring interest in a lot more clubs around the area as well. So, in 1960, Ronnie Cray is thrown into prison again for 18 months for running a protection racket and related threats. While Ronnie's in prison, they're still gaining a lot of influence in the West End because of Esmeralda's barn. They basically are running a protection racket. They're investing in other establishments. Because they're in the West End and they're such big names, and, I mean, they're fucking straight-up gangsters, right? This ends up making them almost like celebrities, all right, like criminal celebrities. And they were very, very concerned with their public appearance you know, how the public saw them. And the Cray twins adopted, uh, a, like a norm according to which anyone who failed to show the due respect 
to the Cray twins or any establishment that they had any interest in, they were fucking punished, all right? One of the guys that they were assisted by was a banker named Alan Cooper, and he wanted protection against the Cray's rival, who were the Richardsons, and they were based out of South London. And the Richardsons, they were literally known as the Torture Gang. All right, these dudes were fucking brutal, absolutely brutal. So they do end up coming up in later episodes as well. So through the 1960s, the Cray brothers, they are widely seen as like prosperous and charming, just celebrity nightclub owners. You know, they're it's the swinging 60s, man, in London, right? In 1962, part of a movie was shot in one of their clubs. And it's funny as shit because the Craze told the director, they're like, listen, you know, this area is dangerous, which it was. That was that was no lie. But they said, unless you let us look after you, you know, you might get hurt. So you might want to start paying us protection money. And it fucking worked. All right. They're li- they're living a fuck pretty glamorous life, man. They got a little bit of fame. They were treated like celebrities. They started hanging around nobility, too. And a large part of their fame was due to their non-criminal activities. Like I said, you know, they were on the celebrity circuit. They were photographed by David Bailey on more than one occasion. They were socializing with lords, MPs, socialites. They were in hanging out with... Show business celebrities like uh, George Raff, Frank Sinatra, Peter Sellers, Judy Garland, Diana Doors, Jane Mansfield, Danny LaRue, Barbara Windsor, just, I mean, real named people. And they got protection rackets going on. They're running fraud scams. They got clubs. The headquarters was a family home on Valance Road, right? Ronnie organized this place like the fucking military. And the place was referred to as Fort Valance because it was on Valance Road. And uh, Ronnie was called the Colonel. They had all these crimes going on, all right? But there's also people who are disappearing, too. Everyone always said that it was the craze, but nobody did anything about it. There was never any investigations. Until 1964, when a dude named Leonard Reed, who was known as Nipper Reed... He was promoted to detective inspector, and he was given the district in the East End, and he made his first job to take down the Cray Twins, and everyone knew the East End was ran by the Crays, South End was ran by Richardson's, and other areas were ran by other guys, but the West End was pretty much a free-for-all. Now, the firm as a whole, like I said, they were funded by clubs, protection rackets, and frauds. One of the frauds that they would do is they would set up fake companies, and they would order goods from other companies. And after doing this to like four or five companies for four or five months straight, when it would come to where they had to pay for all this shit, they would close the fake company down and disappear. And then they would just resell everything. And it was good and steady money like all of this shit was good steady money coming in coming in and i mean it was ran like a mafia style criminal enterprise it was organized crime now in july 1964 ronnie becomes headline news and the mirror newspaper runs an expose and his name was linked with a guy named lord boothby and this was a homosexual scandal all right, this was huge news, and it was news that was leaked by the cops. The thing about this expose is, even though they had a photo of Ronnie Cray and the Lord Boothby together, the newspaper still wouldn't state the Cray's name because they were scared, and they wouldn't truly name like Lord Boothby either. Now, Ronnie was openly gay to all his friends and family and people that knew him, and the thing about it was. Nobody's going to make fun of Ronnie Cray to his fucking face, all right? Because he would smash your fucking skull with anything in his hand or his fist if he had to. Didn't matter. The dude was irrationally violent because he was a fucking paranoid schizophrenic. So nobody even said anything about it, all right? Now, it's said that Reggie was bisexual as well. Probably true. Reggie does eventually get married, and we'll get to that in part two. But uh, But Ronnie, yeah, he was... 
openly a uh, homosexual. So when this news broke, Ronnie didn't fucking really care because, I mean, it was Lord Boothby pictured with a fucking known gangster, both of which are rumored to be homosexuals. So Lord Boothby is really the one getting hurt. Ronnie doesn't fucking care. He was actually relieved. Like I said, most of the people around him knew they didn't care. He denied the relationship with Boothby, but never denied that he was gay. And honestly, he was really relieved that he could be himself in public now. And like I said, nobody would question it. Nobody would make fun of him. So even though it was the 60s, swing of 60s, you know, free love, whatever, it was still kind of taboo. So a week later, while a crime reporter named Lynn Lewis was sitting at the at his news desk at the at the mirror, a man walks up to him and says, you guys are going to lay off this story. I'm a printer from downstairs. I've seen this story. Word has come from the East End that you are not to go any further. You're not safe in this building if you run stories like this. And the news guys took this shit seriously. Because first off, they're like, how the fuck did the Cray Twins even find out? The Cray Twins knew everything that was going on. So the news guys took it serious. <laughs> so Lord Boothby, even though they really didn't say too much in the article, it was enough. So Lord Boothby ended up suing, all right? And in late summer of 1964, two apologies were printed in this newspaper. One was to Lord Boothby, and one was to Ronnie Cray. And after that, the scandal never went anywhere because of the Cray's reputation. The newspaper backed down. They fired their editor. They printed, like I said, two apologies, and they actually paid Lord Boothby 40,000 pounds in an out-of-court settlement. Now, as a result, other newspapers were unwilling to talk about any kind of Cray Twins criminal activities after that. That's how much of a reputation these dudes had. And by the way, the funniest shit is how Ronnie Cray and Lord Boothby actually met and started talking and shit. Ronnie Cray wanted to start his own fucking town in Enugu, Nigeria. He had traveled there often, okay? He was, they were funding this shit. They were pulling money in from like investors. They were using their own money. He wanted to build a fucking town, his own town. They wanted to like build a school, you know, and all this other shit. Hard telling what Ronnie really wanted. But they had run out of money at a certain point, so they went to the Lords to try to ask for more money. And, you know, obviously Lord Boothby's like, I'm not really going to give you any money, but their association was enough to basically stir a lot of controversy. So by October 1964, the Crays are in West London, all right? They're loving the spotlight. They're hanging out with Lords. They're hanging out with fucking famous people all the time. Now, here is a story about one of their main guys in the firm named Albert Donahue. This is a story of how he gets into the firm, and he's an important character, otherwise I wouldn't add this story as context, all right? Now, like I said, he Albert Donahue is a huge part of the firm. Um, he was Reggie Cray's right-hand man. He was his chief executive. He helped him with everything. He also was a driver. He was a money collector for the twins. Uh, he would go collect money from their clubs in the West End. He was basically their face. If Albert Donahue showed up, you knew that you did not fuck with him or because he was directly reporting to Reggie. So Donahue had a reputation already. I mean, he was definitely a bad guy in the East End throughout the 50s and 60s, you know, not too huge of a bad guy, but he had a reputation of his own. So this is the context to Albert Donahue getting into the firm, and you'll just see what kind of shit we're talking about. There was an incident with a guy named Lenny Hamilton. Now, Lenny had known the twins when they were younger. He actually tried to break up a fight the twins had with a cop. So one day, Lenny Hamilton is at the Regency Club, and he was working for Harry Abrams at the time, who had his own gang in which Albert Donahue was a part of at that time. He was a part of Harry Abrams' gang. 
So one of the Cray's firm, a guy named Pat Conley was there, and he, he was drinking with a younger couple. Some men arrived from South London. They bought the group a drink. Hamilton ordered one for himself and the other young man, but didn't know what the girl was drinking, so he asked her. The man that was with her threatened Hamilton. He took offense to it. And Pat Conley, who was sitting there, stated, You don't do that to Lenny Hamilton. So Lenny Hamilton goes to visit the toilet. He goes in there to take a piss. And this dude follows him in there, and this brawl breaks out. Lenny Hamilton attempted to go at this dude with a fucking razor blade. And this guy turned out to be Buller Ward's son. Buller Ward was friends with the Cray twins. So Hamilton's close friend, a guy named Andy Paul, he was living with him at the time. And, you know, he would uh, he would work for the Crays as like a doorman. He says one morning around 1 a.m. he came home when Hamilton was in bed and said that Ronnie wanted him to visit him at Esmeralda's barn. He then proceeded to get a taxi to Knightsbridge to Esmeralda's barn in Wilton Place and asked the cab driver to wait. When Lenny Hamilton walked upstairs, he saw that all the gambling tables were closed down and there were seven or eight people standing on either side. They told him to go into the kitchen and when he opened the door, Ronnie Cray is standing there. He had a big armchair like next to this cooker, and he invited Hamilton to sit down. Lenny Hamilton sits down, and Ronnie says, you know, what's going on, Lenny? You caused a bit of a trouble in the Regal. You know, we get protection money from them. So Lenny is like, fuck, man. So he gets up to leave, and two men come, and they hold him down in that seat. And then he sees Ronnie heating a piece of steel, that he would usually use to sharpen knives on a gas stove, okay? And he's heating this piece of steel until it's fucking white hot. And he comes at him with this fucking poker, and he just singes Hamilton's hair. And then Ronnie started setting fire to his suit, and then he took the poker, hit his fucking cheeks with it, burned his cheeks, and then he held it across his eyebrows and burned those off. Then Ronnie walks over to the stove again, looks back, and says, Now I'm going to burn your eyes out. And as he comes towards him, a guy named Limehouse Willie called out from the guys who were watching, No, Ron, don't do that. And then Ronnie just stops, turns and goes to walk away and looks at looks at Lenny Hamilton and he's like, Do you want a fucking donut? Swear to Christ, man. And the best part is, is like, There's so many witnesses to this shit, Leslie Payne being one of them, who's also going to come up in in the later episodes. But that's the kind of shit that you're dealing with with Ronnie fucking Cray. All right? He's not right. So Hamilton goes, and he returns to the taxi outside. Because he was being followed by a firm car, he goes to his friend Harry Abrams' house, who he was, you know, not really working for. He was just friends with the dude. Now, Abrams was not there, but he came home with a guy named Albert Donahue, okay? Now, Albert at this time had just been released from prison after doing three years. And he looks at Lenny Hamilton's face, which, like I said, he had been hit in the cheeks with a fucking hot iron poker and had his fucking eyebrows singed off. And he asked who did it to him, and Hamilton wouldn't fucking tell him. He's like, I'm not even going to tell you, man. So... Albert Donahue basically talked a bunch of shit about the guy who tortured him, and he didn't even know who did it. He was just saying, you know, I can't believe somebody would do that to you, man. You know, you should fucking blow his brains out, blah, blah, blah. Didn't even know who tortured him. So Albert Donahue, after this, he goes to a bar called the Crown and Anchor to have a drink. So he's drinking there for a little bit, and then he looks around and he noticed that all the people in the bar are slowly moving away from him. And that was when Reggie Cray comes up behind him, shoots him in the fucking foot, and then Ronnie grabs him and drags him the fuck outside. Albert Donahue walks to the fucking hospital, gets his foot checked out, gets a cast put on it, gets all fixed up and everything. While he's at the hospital, he gets a message that says the Cray twins wanted to see him. 
and he was told to visit later that night at Fort Valance, you know, to go to their house on Valance Road. So this motherfucker walks from the hospital to their place on Valance Road with a cast on his fucking foot, just got shot by Reggie. And that's where the twins told Donahue that they did what they did to Lenny Hamilton because he got too flashy, too big for his boots. And then the twins offered Albert Donahue a job. They offered him a pension and gave him a job in the firm and basically was like, hey, come work for us. Quit fucking doing all these dumbass robberies. Just come work for us. You'll be fine. We'll put you on a pension. Yes, the Cray twins and the firm had a fucking pension program for their fucking gangsters, by the way, which is step above the rest. You know what I mean? So... So two days later, Hamilton's uh, protector from Billingsgate, a guy named George Cornell, whose name is going to come up in part two, comes to visit and he gave Harry Abram's wife 200 pounds with instructions to make sure that Lenny Hamilton was taken care of. A day later, Charlie Cray shows up and gave her another 100 pounds. And finally, the Crays sent their doctor the next day to treat Lenny Hamilton and give him some ointments and make sure that his burns were going to be healed up and nice and everything like that. Now, Donahue said nothing to the cops about any of this shit happening. Like I said, remember his name, it will come up later again, but Albert Donahue becomes one of the Cray Twins' most trusted associates, okay? Paymaster, he's an enforcer. The most violent years of the Cray Twins, Albert Donahue was right there as a number two guy. He would go to the West End all the time, collect money from the nightclubs. Like I said, he was the face that the Cray gang used so that people would know a club was owned by the firm. So that nobody would fuck with that place. So, that is the end of part one. In part two, we have... The Cray Twins loving the West End. We have Nipper Reed still investigating the Crays, in which he could not find anybody to testify against them. Then we have the rival gang, the Richardsons, which come more into play. Ronnie helps somebody break out of fucking prison. And then we have some murders coming in part two. This is definitely going to be a three-part series. So, I hope you enjoyed part one. See you folks on the flip side. Let's read some reviews here. From the old U.S. of A., we got Dale Cinco, five stars. Y'all are my kind of people. Says, I'm definitely a newbie to the podcast and stumbled on it by total accident, but it has quickly become a daily staple just to make sure to cover the things that haven't been heard before and is sure to give voice to those who need it most. Aside from the great content, the Facebook group is super active and a lot of fun to be a part of. Bantering with everyone, Justin included, is like hanging out with old friends. 12 out of 10, could not recommend more. Dude, that's a hell of a review. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you like the Facebook group. Yeah, we all, we're all pretty active. I'm always post. well, I mean, I'm on a 30-day Facebook ban right now, but, you know, we're not going to talk about that. Um... I get banned from Facebook quite a bit. But no, when, when I'm not, I mean, we're always posting, having a good time in there. You know, there's lots of memes, lots of good people. You know, I have a few major, major rules, one of which is like, you know, don't get too dirty. And the, the one major rule is absolutely no politics. You do not talk politics in my Facebook group. I'll give you one or two warnings. And after that, the problem will take care of itself. I will personally kick you out of there. I can't bring a bunch of people together with common interests to talk about divisive shit. Not going to happen in my Facebook group. Everybody seems to understand the rules and we all get along great. So, I mean, it works out for everybody. Um, but thank you, man. I'm glad you enjoyed in there and, you know, feel free to post whatever. We posted a lot of fucking memes in there, man. <laughs> 
a lot of memes, some funny shit, a lot of good articles too. Um, a lot of historical articles from like Smithsonian and a lot of crime articles. I try to keep everybody updated on recent cases and stuff like that. New cases that, you know, going on and stuff like that. So I'm glad that you can appreciate that Facebook group. Next, we got five stars, Sand Trooper Mick. Great podcast. Have been listening to podcasts for about a year now and was listening to Dark Windows podcast episode about Travis Walton and subscribed to Mysterious Circumstances. Definitely a must-have podcast. Love the episodes and the creepy vibe you put off and the stories you tell. Keep up the good work, man. Looking forward to future episodes. I appreciate that, man. I try to Definitely try to pick interesting topics, you know, whether it's gangsters or try to debunk some paranormal shit or, you know, bring attention to unknown, less covered cases. So I'm glad you appreciate that, man. Oh, here we got five stars, Shell and Steffi. It says, love this. My wife and I were searching for a new podcast and stumbled across this while looking up the Burger Chef murders. We love Justin. This is our favorite podcast yet. Oh. I will say this, if I'm one of your favorite podcasts, you probably haven't heard very many of them. <laughs> no, I'm, I don't know. Uh, I do appreciate that. Uh, I'm, that was, uh, you know, it's a local, fairly local uh, case for me. There's a lot in Indiana that I try to veer around because a lot of the Indiana cases that are covered are covered just, I mean, just oversaturated. It's always the same, like five or six cases. So try to steer away, but. Burger Chef Murders was actually a request from somebody who was friends with one of the victims when they were in school. So as if I wasn't going to cover it just because it had already been covered quite a few times. But, you know, special requests like that, I always try to accommodate. So thank you very much. I appreciate Shell and Steffi taking the time to leave the review. Much love. What do we got? Five stars. G Highland says, love this podcast. Found your podcast after reading a review about an episode I watched on ID channel. The writer mentioned you had done an episode yourself about the victim. Listened to your show and was hooked. I love how well researched your stories are. I also love the casual manner of your delivery. It feels like I'm sitting down next to a friend and I'm even okay with you drop the F-bomb every once in a while. Thank you. I appreciate that. Just a way of keeping it real on the flip side, right? You're damn right. Hell yeah. I would love to know who mentioned me in a review on the ID channel, which, I mean, you know, about a episode you watched on the ID channel, I should say. But, hey, man, somebody's plugging me. I freaking love it. Next one, we got five stars. I'm a cliche. <laughs> Says Savage, bro. Keep tearing apart the one-star phone warriors. Hell yeah. And then you put some emojis, man, with a big old beer and a cigarette. Oh, I love it, man. I love it. Uh, yeah, I'm actually drinking a beer right now, and um, I've actually almost quit smoking, though. I will say that. I only smoke a few cigarettes a day now. What do we got? Nothing from the UK. Let's go to Australia. So we got, oh, yeah, we got Harry Harbord Morant, or Morant. God, I hope I pronounced that right. If I didn't, man, I'm sorry, dude. Uh, really sorry. Uh, it's five stars. Really enjoy the Western stuff. Hey, man, I love doing the Western stuff, too. It's fun for me. I love that kind of shit. So it's uh, it's fun. That's why I started Blood and Dust, which has been on hiatus for a really fucking long time. But we still have a lot of activity in the Facebook group and the page, and people still want more episodes. So, yeah, if my co-hosts don't get their shit together, I'm going to take it upon myself and, you know, stretch my time even more that I don't have and <laughs> try to get more episodes out on that feed, you know? But thank you, Harry. I appreciate that, man. Who we got here? Five stars. Says Fuzz Me. From Sydney, Australia. You smash these crime stories like a boss. Fucking right, Fuzz Me. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, I appreciate everybody taking the time to leave leave those reviews, man. It really does. It means more to me than you know. And we got another one. It's five stars. This one's from Canada. Melanie Mack. Loving this new-to-me podcast. Uh, I'm about halfway through the past episodes. Was told about you through the Haunts episode. Keep doing what you do. I'm a fan. Hell yeah. I'm not 100% sure what the Haunts episode was, but sounds good to me. Hey, if they're directing you to me, I'm fucking cool with it. <laughs> and thank you, like I said, very much. Thank you for taking the time to leave the review, you know. We got another one, five stars, says, I don't even know how to pronounce that. 
Yoivius. I don't know. I'm sorry, man. I don't know. It says uh, five stars. Amazing. Hey, Justin, I think your podcast is amazing. I do enjoy the juxtaposition of your cool vocal effect with especially the Mafia Gangster podcasts. Hmm. I think you're very insightful. Wishing you all the best from Toronto, Canada. Keep up the great work. Well, Toronto, Canada, I fucking love you guys too, man. You guys are awesome. And um, I love the Mafia and Gangster episodes. I get into that shit so hard, so... It's uh, definitely fun for me as well, but I appreciate you taking the time. Hopefully you enjoyed the, you know, the Cray Twins Part 1 episode, and if you didn't, I apologize, man, but dudes were pretty wild. Definitely worth doing episodes on, in my opinion, so thank you everybody for taking the time to leave reviews, and until next time, I'll see you on the flip side.